Welcome, everyone. This is my second book club for the Federalist Society. The first one, which many of you may have watched, was on the Federalist Papers. My thanks to Peter Redpath for asking me to do a second one. And I've got to say that I'm fortunate to have, again, the same program producer, Rom, along with his assistant, Ted. Tonight's session is divided into three parts. One, why the title to this book club? Two, why three books? And then finally, the meat of the matter, why focus on the words republic, democracy, and democratic republic? But before getting started, let me ask you this question. What did you think of the opening argument before I came on screen? What argument you're probably thinking? You saw a flag, you heard some music, where were the words? For many of you, the words to America the Beautiful are embedded in your memory, but you may not think of those words as making an argument. Next week, however, when we're talking about the argument of the Declaration of Independence, I'm also gonna show you and talk about arguments that aren't as visible or understandable or as arguments. We will uncover the argument in America the Beautiful. Moreover, I will explain why it is that I chose America the Beautiful over other possibilities, such as the Star Spangled Banner or God Bless America. So number one, why the title? Reasoned argument, the counter to cancel culture. Well, actually there are several reasons. Reasoned argument marked the Federalist Anti-Federalist debate that began our constitutional order. So the second book club in a way continues the same theme, but no, you don't have to have watched the first book club. Although maybe you will be inspired to go back and look at it later. Reasoned argument is absolutely required to sustain our form of constitutional government. A lot of people think, well, as long as we're free to speak, nothing matters. Yes, we need freedom of speech in order to have good arguments, but speech, without good arguments and good ideas can in fact fail to nourish the constitutional culture that is needed to support our constitution. Moreover, reasoned argument is the hallmark of the federal society, it always has been. On the other side, cancel culture opposes argument deemed unacceptable for whatever reason. Cancel culture is destructive of basic American rights as to speech, press, and religion. Jean Myers, president of the Federal Society, argues that it extends ominously to thoughts and ideas. Ultimately, the leaders, and I'm saying leaders, not just the followers of cancel culture, they really want a different form of government, one they label as more democratic. And that's what we're going to be getting into when we get into the books. And that's the second point. Why the three books? Why not just one book? Well, in the first book club, it was on the Federalist Papers. And that was published over 230 years ago. That means there was no copyright issue at all. And I could freely copy it as much as I wanted to. The second book club, we we're sampling three books, each still under copyright protection. The amount copied from each must fall within the so-called fair use exception to the copyright law, which is permitted for educational purposes. Within those limits, I will copy certain passages from the following three books. The first book is called Our Republican Constitution, authored by my longtime friend, Professor Randy Barnett. If you received the email notice, and I assume most of you did for this book club, then there was attached to it a link that would take you to a certain number of pages from the introduction. Those same pages will be included on a list of resources in the description of the video, which will be posted afterwards. I can't say enough good things about Randy's book, Our Republican Culture. Randy has performed a real public service. It is easy to understand reading for a general audience and it makes the important point about why 
it really matters whether your vision of the Constitution is that of a democratic constitution or of a Republican constitution. Now, for many of you, that is gonna seem like a terrible, terrible idea. Well, just listen and hear what Randy has to say because it may alter as it did for me, some of my thinking on very important issues that have every bit to do with the crisis that we're going through at the current time. In particular, what Randy does so well is to integrate the Republicanism of the founding and the post-Civil War amendments. I urge everyone to buy this book. But as a disclaimer, I have to say <laughs> that Randy is only responsible for the words in his book. He is not responsible for anything I say in commenting about the book. He has no idea what I'm going to say. The second book is Novus Ordo Seclorum, published in 1985 by the late Professor Forrest McDonald. McDonald was a renowned constitutional historian. And along with some other scholars in a small group, they worked to dethrone the progressive view of the, of the founding. The progressive view looked at the founding in terms of class conflict. That view dominated academia from 1930 at least to 1970. What McDonald and others explained is that, the, I, that ideas, namely about republicanism, drove the founding. In 1987, the bicentennial year of the Constitution, McDonald gave the prestigious Jefferson Lecture. It's sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities. Not only did he give a good lecture, but McDonald proved himself a true patriot. Why? He turned down the $10,000 honorarium that went along with the lectureship. He wouldn't accept the money because he believed that the National Endowment for the Humanities was unconstitutionally created by the Congress. McDonald's book is easily, easily read by any literate person. It goes into great historical detail on the ideas of the founding. The third book, Ethics of Rhetoric, was authored by the late Richard Weaver of the University of Chicago. What he does in his book is to go through some uh, well-known famous arguments and he does an analysis of it. It is only a few of the arguments that we will be looking at and I will give a more extended introduction to that book when we take up the elements of rhetoric. The number of pages divided by the number of sessions for this time is roughly the same as the number of pages per session for the last time. The number of sessions in this book club will be 13, whereas in the last it was 10. The way to think about this is in terms of something like wine tasting. You know about wine tastings. But just think of this as a matter of book tastings. So the third point or part of today is the um, question I posed in the notice that you got. Do we live in a democracy, a republic, or a democratic republic? The title of Professor Barnett's book, as I said, is Our Republican Constitution. But in the question I posed, I left out the word constitution. Why? Well, first of all, Americans live under two constitutions, not only the federal, but a state constitution, unless you're living abroad, in a foreign country or in a US territory. As the pandemic has clearly demonstrated, the amount of freedom that you enjoy depends very much on whether you live under governments in California or New York, as opposed to those in Texas and Florida. But it's not just government that is promoting cancel culture, it's also big tech and other woke corporations and they're spreading their cancel culture approach beyond those other blue states virtually everywhere. Nobody can ignore what's happening. Many people, including my wife, never want to talk about politics. But at this point, cancel culture has become a battlefield at the local school board level. This book club will provide basic reasoned arguments 
by looking at not only the founding itself, but the arguments that built up to the founding and the arguments that cemented the founding going forward and in the struggle against slavery. All of this is critical in terms of understanding the background that you can have at a basic level to form the arguments to reject cancel culture. So now we turn to defining the Republic. Remember, if you took the Federalist uh, Book Club, watched it, in Federalist 39, what I was doing was quoting, among other things, Madison writing as Publius saying, we may define a republic to be, or at least may bestow that name on a government, which derives all of its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people and is administered by persons holding their offices during pleasure for a limited time period or during good behavior. Now, Madison was being very accurate and careful when he said, we may define, or at least we may bestow. Why? Because as we will see later in these slides from Horace McDonald, what constituted a republic, how it was defined at the time, varied depending on the people who were arguing or describing it. And still to this day, there are nations around the world that use the term republic in ways that have no basis in any of the theory for republicanism. So in terms of what we can begin with is the Republican Guarantee Clause. Article four, section four of the constitution provides, the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a Republican form of government. Now there's no definition within the constitution of what a Republican form of government is. The Supreme Court has avoided trying to define it. But the assumption is that what we have in the federal government is a Republican form of government, and it is up to the federal government to take action if the states cease to have a, re a Republican form of government. How might that occur? If, as happens in some countries, a governor in a state would essentially come along and attempt to abolish the a legislature because it is absolutely critical to a Republican form of government that you have a larger state slater. Remember, Madison talked about that, in fact, the elements of it. So our Republican constitution, one model, okay? Now this, the following slides are going to be, unless otherwise indicated until I get to Forrest McDonald, they're gonna be direct quotes out of Randy's book. So what does Randy say? In this book, I call these divergent views, the Democratic Constitution and the Republican Constitution, but I don't intend these labels to be partisan. And if you read the whole book, you'll realize that he sticks to that. There are political conservatives who hew to some aspects of the Democratic Constitution and some progressives who adopt aspects of the Republican one. Well, that's the nature of our constitution. It is fundamentally Republican, but it has democratic elements. So I often use the term democratic republic, but it is important not to leave out republic and just call it a democracy because it's not. For many Americans, a democracy, they equate with our constitution. But guess what? There are countries all over the world that call themselves democracies and don't have any system at all like ours. Many of the people fill in conceptions, um, flip between conceptions, depending on which happens to be to conform to the re results they like. And you know that's a great difficulty in being consistent. And the failure to be consistent is a weakness in the arguments of people both on the right and the left. He says, I choose the terms democratic and Republican constitutions because both terms have deep roots in our constitutional history and neither is pejorative. Well, but he's gonna go forward and the deep roots are fundamentally Republican. There are points of, as he says, democratic roots, but he will essentially, I think, um, 
show that they are relatively subordinate to the Republican element. This and the following quotes start on page 18 and go to 26. In other words, I'm telling you where these are in the pages that you have. I'm not gonna list the page numbers on every slide. Okay, we the people is what he starts out with. At this core, at his core, the debate is about the meaning of the first three words of the constitution, we the people. Those who favor a democratic constitution view we the people as a group, as a body, as a collection, collective entity, those who favor the Republican Constitution view we the people as individuals. Now, that was not always true. That is, not until we get the Civil War, post-Civil War amendments. Why? Because states were left with a great deal of control that was dictated by constitutions that were much more democratic than was the fed than is the federal constitution. This choice of visions, and he says, has enormous real world consequences. I couldn't agree more with that. Each vision of we the people yields a different conception of what is called popular sovereignty. Those who adhere to the democratic constitution hold a different conception of popular sovereignty than those who adhere to the Republican. Now, this comes about largely after the post-Civil War amendments. Why? Before then, you had the Anti-Federalist, and especially we'll talk later about Patrick Henry arguing in the Virginia Ratifying Convention, how dare you essentially say we the people of the United States, it should be we the, the states. That was the fundamental difference between a confederation as explained in the last, the last um, book club and the new federal government. But since we became more Republican, there has been a greater drive we will soon we will see near the end of this, in which I discussed also in the last book club, from the progressive movement to drive us much more in a Democrat towards a democratic constitution. Popular sovereignty was first developed in the United States at the time of the founding. Why? Every country has to, as a modern state, have a sovereign. If you don't have a sovereign, you're not recognized as a nation state, as a state. Now, this notion of sovereignty has not existed for all time. The rise of sovereign states doesn't really begin until after 1648 and the Treaty of Westphalia in Germany. Trani goes on to say it's a principle of political theory that sovereignty or the right to rule must reside somewhere in any polity. Unfortunately, a lot of law students never learn this, and the word sovereignty is almost never mentioned, in my experience, in law school. While the ultimate sovereign was thought to be God, which may surprise a lot of people, people who ruled the world on earth, monarchs claimed to be the sovereign rulers of their own people, ruling by delegation from God, or what was called divine right. England was treating the colonies we thought in a way that was similar to what was going on on the continent between kings and their own people. But generally in England, the king at the time internally was not doing that. England was set apart from other countries by its form of government, much of which we carried over. The next session, we'll talk about the Declaration of Independence and go through that in more detail. The sovereign and the government. When Americans had their revolution and rejected the rule of the English king, political theory was required to say who was the sovereign. And they said the people themselves. The problem is, as explained in the rest of this, is that that sovereign, how do you reconcile the sovereign with the people who are being ruled? I remember that years ago, I was in a Liberty Fund conference with Forrest McDonald. And at the time, I thought, like many lawyers, that the notion of popular sovereignty was kind of a myth and that the real sovereign was, at least externally, the federal government. And I think externally it is. But the real theory of the Constitution is that the people parcel out their power, some to the federal government and some to the state government, and only the people can change it. That's critical to what 
is in Randy's description and distinction between the democratic constitution and the Republican one. If sovereignty is conceded, conceived as residing in the people collectively, the people as a body, the will of the people, that's what governs. Will or desires of the sovereign monarch, yeah, you can understand that. But in what sense does a body of individual persons have a collective will or desire? They don't. In practice, what it becomes, the will of the people must rest on the desires of a majority or supermajority of the people. It does not because it cannot rest on the desires of everyone. So this is very important. It is what in a well-constructed democratic constitution based on a collective conception of popular sovereignty. It's one that allows the will of the majority to prevail. What does this mean? It means first and foremost, any principle or practice that gets in the way of the will of the majority or, uh, or a majority rule is presumptively illegitimate and requires special justification. That is what's driving the effort to get rid of the Electoral College. Clearly, the Electoral College is not democratic. And as long as it is there, it is a bulwark of much of our republicanism. And that's why it becomes the target for many who want to make the country more democratic, make the Constitution more democratic. It also ha it has a significant view about effect about individual rights. The only individual rights are legally enforceable, are a product of majoritarian rule. So under a democratic constitution, first comes government and then comes rights. Now, that may be hard to digest that, that some people think this way, but I can tell you from personal experience and conversation that there are certain lawyers who believe, for instance, that in Cuba, there is no need for a Bill of Rights because they're, quote, the people govern. That was actually told to me by one of the lawyers in the Chicago 7. That trial, we're going to have a clip from in a little bit. A democratic constitution has to be a living constitution because it has to live and change as the majorities change, so that today's majority is not bound by what is called the dead hand of the past. The will of yesterday's majority cannot override the will of the majority today. Under a democratic constitution, judges are told they should exercise their power of judicial review with restraint. They should defer to the will of popularly elected branches by adopting a presumption of constitutionality that simply presumes perhaps irrebuttably, that the people have acted properly. This presumption of constitutionality, it seems to me, has no basis in the text of the Constitution. Why? If we're living under a government of limited powers, and it, the federal government and the Congress have to justify their exercise of power, they're supposed to point to the place in the Constitution that shows that they have that power. But if you assume ahead of time that they have that power, You've already essentially gutted what the framers put in the Constitution by way of limiting powers. The belief in the correctness of the democratic Constitution is pervasive among both progressives and conservatives, and among Democrats and Republicans, that you might be sitting there wondering what other view of the Constitution there would, could be. Now, if you are wondering that, hopefully you will learn through this book club, that the notions that you have may be the product of the progressive movement, which since the late 1800s, since the late uh, 19th century, have propagated notions that undermine our Republican constitution and have instead created an administrative state. What separates a Republican constitution from a democratic constitution is the conception of popular sovereignty. We the people is a collection of individuals, those in government and merely a small number, subset of people who serve as their servants. Okay, this is an important concept, servants or agents. 
That's what we think of our representatives and senators. Unfortunately, too many of them don't think of themselves that way. The just powers of these servants must be limited to the purpose for which they are delegated. That purpose is to secure the pre-existing rights of we the people, each and every one of us. Now, it's not just the Bill of Rights, as we talked about in the last book club. It is heavily dependent on structure. The two things together are important. Obviously, there's not much protection of rights if you don't have an independent judiciary. Under a Republican constitution, first count dirty of the government is equally uh, to equally protect the personal and individual rights from being violated by both domestic and foreign transgressors. The agents of the people must themselves use their delegated powers, not <clears throat> must not themselves use their delegated powers to violate the very rights that they were empowered to protect. That's a wonderful argument in dealing with this mass immigration that we are suffering at this point in this country, which is undercutting the protection of American citizens. The Republican Constitution, the original meaning. In short, under a Republican Constitution, the meaning of the written Constitution must remain the same until it is properly changed. That seems so antiquated to Democrats, not the party Democrats, but Democrats in the small d sense. If you think that we have a purely democratic constitution, then why not update it? Well, in part it's because people don't understand the function of a constitution as opposed to the function of a statute. Yes, statutes have to be updated. They go out of date as technology and circumstances change. But if you understand the founding and the beauty of the constitution as discussed in the first book club, you realize that it was structured in such a way to last for the ages because it only addressed the fundamental powers of government that would be necessary no matter what government or what the times were 100 years from then. And it's lasted because there was this understanding. Under a Republican constitution, a completely different picture of judges emerges. Like legislators, judges too are servants of the people, and their primary duty is to adhere to the law of the Constitution about any statute enacted by Congress of the states. You know, there's been debate over a number of years about eliminating diversity jurisdiction. Why? Well, scholars and some federal judges believe that just dealing with individual claims from state to state is beneath what they should be doing. What they should be doing, many of them think, is pronouncing on the Constitution. That's their job, is to, in, many, in the minds of many of them, is to update the Constitution to current circumstances. Judges are given lifetime tenure precisely so that they may hold democratic legislatures within the proper scope of their just powers, and by doing so, protect individual rights. That's exactly what is said in Federalist 78 that we went over. Incompatible views of popular sovereignty. It is important to recognize that the democratic and Republican views of popular sovereignty and we the people are ultimately incompatible because both worldviews are deeply rooted in our constitutional history and traditions. Holders of each have tried to incorporate the most appealing features of the other, at least they have in the past. That's kind of waning with cancel culture, which was not the phenomenon it is today when Randy wrote his book. So in practice, a constitution that hews to one of these visions may still accommodate some significant element of the other, albeit in a subordinate way. And that's the key, albeit in a subordinate way. Now, I put this article up from The Atlantic that appeared about a year ago. It's called, America is a Republic, not a Democracy. It is a dangerous and wrong argument. It's dangerous because it exposes the fallacies that 
tend to dominate the major media, and most importantly, we'll see and know already academia. Now, the writer of this article is, uh, is a professor, and to his credit, he at least goes through some of the Federalists before arguing for changes in the Constitution. But his understanding that somehow the Federalists were in, in the Constitution they created was democratic. Just read Randy's book and read uh, Forrest McDonald's book, and you'll see, as I discussed last book club, they were opposed to democracy, at least as it is understood today. So now I'm turning to Novus Ordo Seplorum. Now, this is at the beginning, and again, on the notice that you got for the book club, there was a certain number of pages, about six pages. And that's why I'm taking, taking these clips from. Society sorely divided as Americans were in regard to independence. I mean, it wasn't that every American was for independence. Many of them were the establishment and were doing quite well working and trading with the British and didn't have any notion that they wanted to in, uh, be independent. The patriots among them, namely those who wanted a separate country, at least in principle, were nearly unanimous in their understanding of what independence entailed. The short range was win the war. The longer term necessity in the language, in the language of the, was to institute a new government, laying the foundation of such principles on such principles and organizing its powers in such a form as there shall be most likely to affect their safety. Well, notice they were united in a way that you can't say Americans are united today. The last, the last, uh, the latter task appeared with some reason to pose no difficulty, almost to a man patriots were agreed that the proper ends of government were to protect people in their lives, liberty, and property, and that these ends could best be obtained by a Republican forum. They had abundant experience, and note that in many other countries that we shove into democracy, they have no experience. Probably the more Americans have participated directly in government at one level or another than they had in any other people on earth. We'll talk later about the importance of the jury trial in educating the colonists to understand what was involved in government. And if their experience turned out to be inadequate, enough of them were familiar with theoretical works of Aristotle and Polybius, of Machiavelli and Harrington, of Locke and Hume, Montesquieu, to see them through. But it proved to be far less simple than they had anticipated. Yes, there were great difficulties and we saw what happened during a period of years when they were in a confederal form and it wasn't going well. And finally, they had to switch and go into a convention and we had the ratification debates after that. And the question was, what new form of government do we need? So what are the guiding frameworks uh, post-independence? They were guided as well as limited by four sets of considerations none of which was so clear as subsequent or even contemporary writings would lead one to believe. In other words, to really understand the founding, like, like Horace McDonald did, you had to be reading very much. You had to read all of the critiques about the founding, both on the left and on the right, to find out what in fact were, to the best of our knowledge, uh, happening then. Now, a lot of this was spurred First of all, by the first bicentennial in 1976. After, beginning after 1976, there's a treasure trove of research on what was going on at the time of the founding in a way that was not understood for many years, certainly during the heyday of the progressive movement. This information was not out there. So we have suffered because this information wasn't out there. The first was inherent in their purpose, that of providing protection for the lives, liberty, and property of citizenry. By the way, the other elements in that were republicanism, history, and political theory. 
we'll go through republicanism. We won't go through um, experience in history. We'll go on to political theory after that. Republicanism, what did it mean? The second governing and limiting consideration, the commitment to republicanism. A few of the framers questioned the desirability of adhering to a Republican form of government, thinking that for that form to be less compatible with liberty than a limited monarchy was. That was probably Hamilton. But none believed that any other form would be acceptable to the American people. Though the framers shared the commitment in the abstract, they were far from agreed as to what republicanism meant apart from the absence of hereditary monarchy and hereditary aristocracy. Moreover, no matter how republicanism was defined, the concept, again, as we see again, carried with it a number of implications that were not entirely consonant with most Americans' ideas about liberty and property. Okay, references to political theory. The framers had a large body of political theory at their disposal. To be sure, most of them were prone to dismiss such speculative theory lightly. Experience must be our only guide, said John Dickinson. Reason may mislead us. Now, it's clear that the framers in the Constitutional Convention were not philosophers, thank God, but they were philosophic men, meaning they were extremely well-educated, broadly educated. They, in particular Madison and Hamilton, but Madison, most of all, had studied all of the political theory, essentially, that was available up to that time. So, yet, yeah, in, in, it formed a great part of their understanding and of their perspective apparatus than they always realized or were willing to admit several times in the convention Madison, Hamilton and Madison referred to statements by Hume without attributing them to Hume. Others referred to natural law, to John Locke, to Montesquieu, to Blackstone, again, often with not mentioning where it was coming from. So, okay, um, what we have here is a clip that I wanna show you in order to elucidate in some way what I mean by the leaders and moving the country in a more, quote, democratic way. So, Brom, would you play the clip, please? Okay. Um, what we have here. Is when we walked in here this morning, they were chanting that the whole world is watching. This is what revolution looks like. Cultural. I don't have time for cultural revolution. It distracts from actual revolution. The Trial of the Chicago Seven is not a documentary. It's a painting where journalism is a photograph. It's not as much about 1968 as it is about today. Who started the riots? Was it the protesters or was it the police? If we leave here without saying anything about why we came in the first place, it'll be heartbreaking. Our streets! Our streets! Our streets! 1968 was a bad year uh, in America. March, Martin Luther King was shot and killed. Eight weeks later, Bobby Kennedy was shot and killed. This is all happening against the backdrop of the Vietnam War. Tens of thousands of 18-year-old kids were being drafted every month, going to Vietnam, getting massacred. So a group of activists, Abby Hoffman, Jerry Rubin, Tom Hayden, Dave Dellinger, Rennie Davis, John Freund, Lee Weiner, and an eighth, Bobby Seale, the head of the Black Panthers, came to Chicago to lead what were supposed to be peaceful protest. This is it. It's time. We're not rushing the police. My name so, how did you like that peaceful protest in the courtroom? Ron <coughs> didn't stop it where I want him to stop it. Ron, can you go back to that piece so that they can see a clearly what's going on in the courtroom? Okay, so here they are in the courtroom with their clenched fists and the judges at the bench. This was celebrated and is being celebrated 
in this movie that was released in 2020. Notice that the director Sorkin said, this is not so much about 19, uh, 1968 as it is about today. Well, what about those fire bombings of federal courthouses, the federal courthouse in Portland? Is this the model for today? Is that a peaceful protest? What we're dealing here with is not just the phenomenon, but the arguments. That is the arguments and the statements, the statements about what? Characterization. When you name things, you end up controlling the narrative. There is a narrative that is controlled by certain media outlets and cancel culture doesn't want any competition with that narrative. So what happened in 1968 in the trial in 1969 is recorded in this movie. The movie itself is an argument. Now, all movies tell a story and some of them have just a very simple story, you know, a story that doesn't amount to much. Other movies have serious stories. Whether you agree with this or not, this is about a serious thing. For me, it's very personal because in 1969, I was a freshman at the University of Michigan Law School. And that trial started at late September. And during that year, or during the half year that the trial went on, uh, many of my classmates would leave on Thursday night, drive to Chicago so that they could be in line early to get into the courtroom. And leading this was a person, a lawyer named um, Kunstler, who as the New York Times noted later, he was the most controversial and maybe the best known lawyer in the country at one point at least. What did he do? He encouraged the disruption of the courtroom. Can you have a peaceful protest inside of a courtroom? I'm sure that unfortunately, the judge was the perfect foil. The particular judge was a perfect foil here. But at that point, the idea of playing your case, a criminal case at least in the media was relatively new and very few federal judges were really up to the task. As a federal district court clerk later in, in New Orleans, I came across and was there in some very high profile cases. And I saw that some judges just didn't want to touch them and that other judges would come down and, and handle them very well. But it takes a lot to handle that situation. So what happens? Counselor becomes a model a model for lawyers, a model who has disrupted the courtroom. Where is the rule of law in this? Anyway, what happened after is very interesting because it goes on. And the question is, what happens to the radicalism? And we're told that much of the radicalism ends with the end of the, the Vietnam War. But wait a minute, what happened in terms of creating this phenomenon occurred well before the Vietnam War. That is, the Vietnam War, while it had been going on for a long time, really didn't involve Americans until 1965. That's when we started to send troops in. But the key players in this were already organizing in 1960. Who are the key players? Well. The non-disruptors or the less noticeable disruptors, the real brains behind this was a University of Michigan graduate named Tom Hayden. He's the one in the clip where he yells, I'm not interested in cultural revolution. I'm interested in real revolution. The interesting thing is that in 1960, there were two groups formed. One was the Students for a Democratic Society, founded by Tom Hayden and other young people. And the other was Young Americans for Freedom, founded that same year. The interesting part about this is what they did. What they both did was to issue a statement, an argument. There was the so-called 
Port Huron statement, which um, Hayden wrote the first draft of. But ultimately, after two years of discussion among the other members, that statement ended up to be over 60 pages. Meanwhile, the Sharon statement, which was written by those who became members of the Young Americans for Freedom or YAF, this was done in Connecticut at William Buckley's place. And what it reflected was the fusionism that was put forward by Bill Buckley and Frank Meyer. Incidentally, Frank Meyer's father of Gene Meyer's. In any event, the Sharon statement was all about freedom and to some extent virtue. It ran 400 words. Whereas I already said, the Port Huron statement ran over 60 pages. Now, what impact does that have today, if any? So I just wanna put up on the screen so that you can see it, the two statements side by side, and they will be part of the resources that are provided in the description of the um, in the description of the video here. Now, what's the impact of these different things? The sharing statement, the fusionism, was basically carried over into the Federalist Society. That is, the Federalist Society was deemed to be to bring together libertarians and conservatives. That's what it's been. That's what the sharing statement was all about. Unfortunately, the Federalist Society didn't exist when I was in law school. What happened to people who became radicalized um, in law school? Well, some of them went into civil rights work and spent years there, but others went into big law or they went into corporations. And if you follow that track, you will find essentially a lot of what happens in the cancel culture coming from big law and big corporations is coming because those lawyers, in fact, had drunk the Kool-Aid, if you will. They imbibed a notion of democracy, which is different and radical. Indeed, the SDS was known as the new left. The liberals in the Democratic Party were not far left enough for them. And we can see the fruits of what they were preaching back in 1960, 62, today because their agenda was clearly and stated to be a socialist agenda. Now it is coming forth to us. And, and when we look at that, what I wanna do is this is a picture of Tom Hayden. He died a few years ago, but he's gonna tell us, talk about participatory democracy and it's linked to academia. So, Ron, would you play this, please? Well, this is a very long historical and personal article about the beginnings of the student movement, SNCC and SDS, and the, uh, the call for participatory democracy at the founding convention in 1960. Uh, 62, in that period, just that two-year period. Participatory democracy is a jumbly phrase that came from the lips of uh, my philosophy professor at the University of Michigan, Arnold Kaufman, in a seminar. He was quoting John Dewey, who was an elder of SDS, uh, who had conceived of the idea that <coughs> democracy should be broader than voting. It should include voting, but we should have democratic families, not dominated by the father from the top down. We should have democratic workplaces, democratic neighborhoods, not controlled by uh, developers. Uh, more democracy, not less, was the, the idea. And of course, before John Dewey, there were proponents of civil disobedience and direct action like Henry David Thoreau who, who we knew had said, vote yes, but vote with your whole life, not with a simple strip of paper. So we took that to heart. And for, for us, th there wasn't a big 
conflict between direct action, sitting in at lunch counters, and registering black people to vote in the South because you could get killed or arrested or beaten for either. It was all direct action, but at least there was a framework. It was more than a tactic of sitting in and occupying someplace. The framework was to push for more space for the, the human development that was at the center and the social development that was at the center of what we call participatory democracy. I would make the argument that participatory democracy, if understood, can be, should be, will be the only framework for the development of progressive movements and politics in the U.S. That's worth salvaging. Hayden was a very interesting guy. Um, I don't condemn him or anything. I don't agree with his ideas, but he was in many ways well-motivated in the sense that what he believed he was doing was good. I think he was wrong, but why did he believe that? Well, he got it from a particular philosophy professor. And what did they focus on? They focused on the universities and they were very successful in changing universities that all of us know is true if you've been in a major university and especially in an elite university in any time in the last 20 or more years. So they had a framework, as he said, and they followed a framework. Now, on our side, freedom is a framework in a way, but they have a vision that is almost a pseudo-religion. And in many ways, they're admirable because they have some of them, not all of them. Some of them have great zeal at what they want to do. And they want to transform this country completely. And some of the things that he said about neighborhoods and all, you can see it in the policy of certain administrations where they want to change through federal monies, the makeup of neighborhoods and other things. And the whole business about the... Um, the suspension of evictions by landlords. All of these things are products of the view that is extremely communitarian. Now, community and individualism is always in kind of a tension in this country. And federalism is in large part an element that allows us to break down total power and have it localized in states and then further localized. And that's the way most Americans love it. But until people understand not only what is happening, but in fact, how and why it came about and what can be done to counter it, then it will continue to progress. So I wanna look at two articles by a great scholar and that is Victor Davis Hanson. He was a classicist. He really is a very, very learned man but unusual for a very learned man. He is a great writer and speaker on practical and political affairs of this day and age. He has two columns that kind of fit in here. One, he says, this isn't your father's left-wing re revolution. What he goes on to say is that, um, you know, the, the drug culture, the sex culture, all of that stuff of the 60s, after a while, those people who were in it to avoid the draft and other things, you know, they went on and they developed a life and they, and they got away from that. Well, yes and no. By and large, they did get away from it. But what Jerry Rubin said in that clip about cultural revolution, that's what happened in the 60s. We haven't even mentioned Woodstock in the 60s, but the 60s were all about social and cultural revolution. And social and cultural revolution in history precedes a real revolution. That's what people need to understand. Real revolutions come based on ideas. You heard Hayden talk about these ideas coming from his philosophy professor. As the author that I've already mentioned, um, on ethics of rhetoric, his other book, great book, is Ideas Have Consequences. 
And John Maynard King said essentially the same thing, and I'm only paraphrasing, that every practical businessman is merely spouting the long the thoughts of a long dead philosopher. Ideas have always run this country, even though we are very practical. As Tocqueville said, the Americans are the most philosophic people in the world, and they think they're the most practical. They're both. That's the beauty of the country. But then, more recently, <laughs> what Hansen says, are we in a revolution and don't even know it? And he goes through everything. This is a great article. You got to read it. And it'll, again, it'll be uh, in the uh, list of resources. We'll give you a copy of it. This, this understanding that people don't realize we are in a revolution. Why? Well, again, much of what I'm going to be talking about in this series is rhetoric. And the problem with the word revolution is become meaningless to people. Why? Because every new product that comes out on the market is advertised as revolutionary. So we're kind of numb to it. Why is it advertised that way? Because for Americans, revolution brings up notions about the founding, the declaration. But you go to an authoritarian country, you start talking about revolutionary things, that's not a good thing to do. We've worn it down. And that's the difficulty, we've worn it down. But he lays out everything we've been talking about in greater detail about cancel culture. What it does is it, it erodes the foundation on which our constitution rests. In a more narrow context, years ago, Justice Scalia said, if the, people, if the American people forget about federalism, don't expect my court to save them. We can't. If the American people forget in practice about our constitution, it'll be like constitutions all over the world. We've got this pretty document and we don't follow it. That's what the stakes are. And that's why we're doing this particular book club so that people understand a little bit more and able to equip themselves and not accept the premises in language that is put out there by the mainstream media. So for instance, a lot of politicians, when they don't like anything that's being done by conservatives, they say, that's a threat to democracy. Well, yeah, it's a threat to the kind of democracy that Tom Hagen and his friends have been propagating. What do you mean by democracy? That's the issue. But more importantly, it is, let's learn more about our Republican form of government. Thank you. Thank you.